Hi everyone, I'm Amy Glake, Social Media Coordinator for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. And today on Arizona Wildlife Views, we'll introduce you to George Andreco, who's truly seen just how amazing wildlife can be in his decades as Chief Photographer for the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Plus, we'll take you inside Liberty Wildlife, a place making a difference when it comes to the rehabilitation of injured wildlife. And later, we'll head down to a special place in Southern Arizona that is truly for the birds. All this and more starts right now on Arizona Wildlife Views. Arizona Wildlife Views is brought to you by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses and the Heritage Fund, lottery dollars working for wildlife. Some projects made possible by the Sport Fish and Wildlife Restoration Fund. As many of us know, getting a good shot of Arizona's wildlife is oftentimes a lot more difficult than it seems. Today, we'll introduce you to someone who's been doing it extremely well for decades at the Arizona Game and Fish Department. Meet my colleague, George Andreco a master of capturing wildlife in photos that are truly unforgettable. The Arizona Game and Fish Department is responsible for more than 800 species. That's a lot of wildlife to conserve and protect. It takes an army of dedicated biologists and volunteers plus one photographer who does an amazing job documenting their work. If you've ever marveled at the images on the Game & Fish website, its social media, or in the agency's Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, you know the work of George Andreco. My name is George Andreco, and I am the Arizona Game & Fish Department photographer. It's a dream job he's had since 1989. Somebody has to do it. I, I guess I'll have to go do it again. All the reintroductions, black a ferret, the wolf, California condor, Apache and Gila trout, Terracoa leopard frog. You know, I was around when it all hit the ground. George has photographed three decades of historic wildlife relocations and recovery efforts. Along the way, he's captured many unforgettable and iconic images, like this one from 1998 at the very first release of endangered Mexican wolves. It was during film days. It's a shot that almost didn't happen. And that ended up being my, my number 36 on the roll of 36, which is usually the one that they destroy in processing. Is it I'm too low or do you need a little higher? Right a little bit. I can't find George it. enjoys yeah, photographing right. all wildlife, so but he's especially okay. fond of birds. That's true. You see the intricacies of their colorations, of their patterns, of their sizes. There's always a new shot or a better pose. I hear a whole lot of birds. He leads photography workshops at birding festivals across the state. It's nice to give back and help people get yeah. better. Sometimes we get photographers who are better photographers than I am. It's, it's art that you, and a passion that you just keep working at. And the more you handle a camera, like anything else, the more you, you see through your lens, the better you get. In wildlife photography, George says you have to be prepared. You have to be patient, but above all else, you have to get outdoors. Being there is th the biggest part. If you're not there, you're missing out. You know, you have, you have to be out there, you have to be prepared. When driving the back roads of Arizona, George's camera is usually riding shotgun. 
The trick is to keep it on the seat <laughs> and not bouncing all over the place. It's always at the ready, just in case. I usually have it turned on and ready to go, just for those instances where wildlife is right there and you might be able to get a couple quick shots. And some of my best deer shots, or, or some good deer shots, were shot from a vehicle quickly, one or two shots, and then gone. The opportunity can flee really quick, too. While a vehicle can be an effective blind for photographing wildlife, it's not always possible to get the shot you want from the cab of a truck. I mean, there's various techniques for approaching wildlife closer. Certainly one of them is the lost keys, and that's simply not approaching wildlife straight on, but zigzagging your way like you're looking at the ground for keys. They look up and they see you, but you're not approaching them dead straight on. That's one of the quickest ways to get wildlife to run away is to make a beeline straight at it. One simple way to pursue wildlife is just to use your tree as a hide. Another way is that I never get to use very much, and that is my ghillie suit. This doesn't work well in the heat. Anything that will disguise you. I mean, there's hunting blinds that are made out there now that pop up and are just wonderful. They have doors and windows. Deer elk a lot of times will be waiting all day to be able to go down and get water. It's a challenge. It's enjoyable. It's um, being out in the wild with the wild, capturing them, hopefully without them even knowing that you're there. George has captured some amazing images, but he's still in search of that perfect picture. There's always new shots to get and better shots to make. You know, you get elk sparring or bighorn sheep butting heads. To get those great shots, you have to shoot a lot of okay shots. And when people see his photos online or in Arizona Wildlife Views, he hopes they see more than just a pretty picture. Well, I hope they see and feel the same thing I do when I, when I took them. Maybe more appreciation of the wildlife. Hopefully that picture will draw you in to want to read more, to learn more, maybe give them a interest or a drive to help us conserve and protect the wildlife. Be a part of having it around for the future generations. If you are a sick or injured bird, you have no better friend than Liberty Wildlife. It has been a world-class wildlife rehabilitation foundation here in Arizona for over 30 years. And it all began with a simple act of caring. We could start in 1973. Well, let's, let's start where it started. Well, when I graduated from veterinary school, I came to Arizona and my first job was with the Arizona Humane Society. People would bring injured wildlife there, and no one else, they were about dogs and cats. And mm -hmm. I said, I'll take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing led to another, and a after I moved on from the Humane Society, they referred everything to me, and by then Game and Fish knew that I would take them. Mm -hmm. So I just was doing it in my backyard, and it kind of grew you know, more and more. The foundation continued to work out of Dr. Orr's one-acre backyard, treating everything from hummingbirds to condors. Over the years, they filled up every inch of available space with cages, flight pens, and medical facilities until 2016, when thanks to a grant from the Rob and Melanie Walton Fund, the conservation group was able to build its own facility on six acres along the revitalized Rio Salado. We had a dream early on when, when it was starting to outgrow the backyard mm -hmm. 
that we needed a place, a permanent place. We needed a place where this could go on without us, you know, that uh, future generations could keep it going. Because it was clear from all the volunteers that there were lots of people out there that would help. Jan Miller is the Foundation's Animal Care Coordinator, and she oversaw the treatment of more than 6,000 animals last year. You know, the heart of the old place is still here, but obviously the uh, ecstatic, ecstatics of it is amazing. Um, we're capable of doing so much more. We already increased by 2,000 animals a year, which is crazy. We thought our first year was going to be a little slow. To start being where we are, nobody was going to find us, but it just went bonkers. Luckily, we have enough space to put them all. And, um, you know, having the availability of having a digital x-ray machine and a surgery table here, we no longer have to outreach to the veterinary clinics and help. And uh, they come in here and help us out here. So, you know, the ease, the treatment that the animal gets is quicker. You know, it's just, it's, it's hand over fist. It's so much better. It's so much better. Sometimes all a young bird needs is a new set of parents to teach it the basics and to care for it until it's time to find its own home in the wild. You know, a lot of these raptors, you don't think about it, but they're really great at being foster parents. And if they do lay infertile eggs, you know, they have to be infertile. And we make sure of that. And then we can hand them babies or fertile eggs from, you know, permitted nest moves if they're in a dangerous situation. And these parents just take it right away. You t it's funny because they'll be sitting on a little egg and you take the egg away and you put in this baby and all of a sudden they're like, oh, it hatched. You know, and they immediately go into parenting mode and start feeding and cooing and making the correct noises. And then those babies, long, long time ago, you used to have to feed and wear camo and use a puppet. Now the parents do that job and they're raised as owls or hawks, whatever they're supposed to be, and they understand it and it just makes a better outcome for all of them. The new facility not only offers increased care for wildlife, but now the public has the opportunity to visit and learn more about some of the critters they share our great state with. We were never able to be open to the public before because we were in Dr. Orr's uh, property, but here we have this wonderful amphitheater that houses a lot of programming. Falcons are the fastest bird on earth. I think the educational aspect is really what it's all about. We are in our heart of hearts of Wildlife Rehabilitation Foundation. That's how we started. But what we realized early on, it was generally the public that, or some kind of conflict with civilization that gets most of these animals in trouble. So we realized that the ideal thing would be able to teach people about the beauty and the benefits of native wildlife. And maybe they'll be more careful in what they do. We try to teach a lot of lessons about what gets these animals in trouble, you know, sticky traps, little things that, that you can do that would make a huge difference. Having a place and education was a big part of it. Because early on, this is a story that uh, a man brought in a great horned owl that he shot himself. And he had tears in his eyes and he said, if I'd known how beautiful it was, I never would have shot it. And so we had to get them out there for people to see after that. We heard that story. The general public aren't the only ones learning a thing or two about wildlife from the new facility. Salt River Project is conducting an experiment here to make their utility poles safer for large birds. In the big giant flight cage, we have the SRP poles, and those poles are replicated by engineers. And what the purpose of that is, is SRP is actually filming the birds that are in there and they're retrofitting those poles with better insulators. And what they're doing is they are watching each of the different species that come in and how they land on those poles. And they'll even pull the, the fitting that's supposed to protect them and recheck it and make sure that they're not getting through it or if they are, how they're getting through so that they can then produce better equipment to better protect these birds on these lines. So it's really a cool experiment that they're working with and doing and getting all that information and data that they can get for each of the different species is a really big step forward for helping these birds with the electric shock and electrocutions. Liberty Wildlife's new facility is also giving new life to feathers that can no longer fly through their federally sanctioned non-eagle feather repository. We're one of two entities in the United States that are allowed to give feathers and bird parts to 
legally registered tribal members. Uh, up till the point of the, the start of this program, there was no legal mechanism for Native Americans to acquire non-eagle feathers for their regalia and their uh, ceremonial and religious practices. It, we think it's mission compatible in a lot of ways, but particularly for every car carcass or feather we send out, it's someone's not taking one illegally from the wild, or we're not making someone um, a criminal for pra trying to practice their religious and cultural beliefs. Liberty Wildlife's mission is to nurture the nature of Arizona through wildlife rehabilitation, natural history education, and conservation services to the community. They have even taken that a step further by designing their new buildings to be as environmentally friendly as possible. So when we set out on this adventure to build a new facility, one of the things we knew we wanted to do was to be as green as we could be. Sustainability is a huge issue with us. So really, you can come to our facility and you can see cool wildlife and you can learn great educational things, but you can also see sustainability in a working, in a working building. And it's been greatly, greatly successful. People really seem to enjoy themselves here. Uh, no one goes away unimpressed. Many of the birds that are treated here are brought in by the public, like these baby hummingbirds that were blown out of their nest. Liberty Wildlife has also become a valued partner with Arizona Game and Fish and other wildlife organizations for their work to help treat and return to the wild large raptors, such as bald eagles and California condors. When it comes to releasing the birds, you know, that is, with the adult animals that come in, we try to make sure they go back to where they came from, as long as it's a pretty safe environment. And, you know, the, uh, the kids, we try to find, a, you know, shelter, food, you know, good water source, everything that's good for them that would make it easier for them to survive. Some of the animals that come into Liberty Wildlife are not able to be released because of their type of injury or other circumstances, and many of those will remain as wildlife ambassadors. But the thrill of returning a bird back to the wild never gets old. Ready, Kenny? One, two, three. Oh, yeah. Perfect. As many years as I've been doing this, it is by far the most rewarding part of the job that we do is by being able to turn an animal free and seeing them take off on those healed wings or whichever and you know off in flight and off they go and it's just it's fantastic it gives you chills and you know brings a tear to your eye even to this day. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's his breathing. It's a Friday in May, and it's Hummingbird Banding Day at Casa de San Pedro in Hereford, Arizona. And he's a broad tail. They're not rare. We just don't get very many of them in this area. Casa de San Pedro is a lovely southern Arizona inn that offers you a bed, breakfast, and birds. Today, it's the mystical hummingbird. Hummingbirds, hummingbirds really... They're so magical seeming, they almost don't seem like a real creature. Uh, and if it really does tend to inspire uh, tremendous emotions in, in a lot of people. We've had people break out in tears, in fact, when they had the opportunity to release a hummingbird. Guests staying at places like Casa de San Pedro have booked their stay months, even years in advance just to get a unique Arizona birding experience. He's looking around, he says, what are you all looking at, guys? Oh, there he goes. And there he goes. <laughs> Spectacular. I mean, everything from the colorations, uh, of course, to just the way that it felt, the vibrations and what have you. Uh, really an amazing thing. And to consider that, you know, it only weighs about what a penny does, it's really incredible. People who travel to Arizona to come bird watch in our state are sometimes affectionately known as bird nerds. It's a male broad tail. Oh, broad tail. There's no red on the top of the head, it's gorgeous only. 
Every year, bird enthusiasts from around the world make their economic impact felt in Arizona, generating more than $1.4 billion in revenue every year. Now, put this hand out, this hand behind your back, and you are a launching pad. That's all you are. Southern Arizona has several bed and breakfasts that cater specifically to these birding aficionados, often hosting birding events like these hummingbird banding sessions. Bird watchers are a rare breed. <laughs> I, get, I get lots of doctors, nurses, professors, people in high stress jobs. And the one thing about birding is that it is so relaxing and you cannot be worried about things at home when you're trying to find a bird. Shirlene DeSantis owns the Ramsey Canyon Inn, a bed and breakfast in Hereford that sits right next door to the Ramsey Canyon Preserve, a site protected by the Nature Conservancy. Her property is surrounded on two sides by the Coronado National Forest. We get tons of birds through here in the spring and in the fall and all year round. And we also get quite a few uh, rare birds here that people come from all over the world to see. Back in the 60s, she was one of the first to recognize the potential of the area to attract birders. Our neighbor in Tucson, Carol Peabody, purchased that 20 acres next door where the Nature Conservancy is now, and he was an ornithologist. And so he made little cabins that he rented out to bird watchers. And he was busy all the time. And so my mom and dad built that little building there uh, and rented that out to bird watchers. So we already had a history. So I knew that, that there was a market for it here. Uh, there was no doubt about it. And when I first opened, I was the only bed and breakfast in the area that, that was catering to bird, birders. Uh, so now I, there's a lot, I have a lot of competition now, but, but back then it was just me. So what is it about Southern Arizona that makes it a prime spot for birds, especially hummingbirds? Is it really the hummingbird capital of the world? Here in southeastern Arizona, what's wonderful about this area is that we are right here where the Rocky Mountains meet the Sierra Madre of Mexico, where the deserts meet the mountains, where the east meets the west, and all of these things converge to give us tremendous diversity of bird species, including hummingbirds. And part of the reason we have so many species of hummingbirds is because we have our beautiful mountains like the Huachucas, the Chiricahuas, the Santa Ritas, the Catalinas, the Grahams. All those mountain ranges are great places for hummingbirds. Hummingbirds, most of the world's hummingbirds are mountain birds. Some of the things that people come from all over to see are the elegant trogon, um, the tufted flycatcher, tanagers, Aztec thrush, uh, several different species of owls, and of course we get 12 to 14 species of hummingbirds. And uh, east of the Mississippi, you only get one. So in the United States, this is, you, you, this is the place to see all 12 species at one time in the fall. So I don't really like to call southeastern Arizona the hummingbird capital of the world, but it's certainly the hummingbird capital of the United States. I'll be back. I'll do this again, that's for sure. It's just, I mean, it's, you know, definitely something you don't get to do, you know, all the time. And uh, I mean, like I said, it's my first time and it's very nice. From beautiful birds to amazing animals and breathtaking scenery, there's no shortage of great photo opportunities in our state. Until next time, for the Arizona Game and Fish Department, I'm Amy Gleick. And now you get out there and enjoy your own Arizona wildlife views. Thanks for watching. To subscribe to Arizona Wildlife Views magazine, which includes the Arizona Wildlife Views calendar, call 1-800-777-0015 or visit www.azgfd.gov slash magazine.